If you're a regular listener of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy, please rate and review us at the Apple Store using iTunes or the podcast app on your iPhone. And so I want to give a special thank you to Ghost Hornet, who just gave us a five-star review. Ghost Hornet writes, Watch your wish list and your mind expand as you absorb, as quickly as humanly and socially possible, years of interesting and thoughtful discussions on the current state of sci-fi and fantasy, as well as the depths of its famous and lost histories. Discovery, debate, and passionate fandom are common hallmarks of this, an indispensable part of today's culture. If you love genre, you'll love this podcast. So, big thanks again to Ghost Hornet for their support. All right, so now let's get to our panel. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 382 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the Eon Flux animated series about a seductive assassin living in a grotesque dystopian future, which originally aired on MTV in the early 90s. And this will include spoilers for everything in the show, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Andrea Kale, making her 10th appearance on the show. She's a graduate of the Odyssey Writers Workshop, and her short fiction appears in the Writers of the Future Anthology, Fantasy Magazine, and Lightspeed. She's the former script supervisor for Late Night with Conan O'Brien, and is currently a staff writer at WWE's Friday Night Smackdown. So Andrea, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Dave. The next up, we've got Tom Gerentzer, making his ninth appearance on the show. His short fiction appears in magazines such as Realms of Fantasy and in books such as New Voices and Science Fiction. His nonfiction book, Think Like Google, is out now. And his short story, All Our Donkeys Were in Vain, appears in the new anthology, The Best of Galaxy's Edge, 2015 to 2017. So, Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be here. And also joining us today is Matthew Kressel, also making his ninth appearance on the show. He's the author of the novel King of Shards, and his short story, The Last Novelist, or A Dead Lizard in the Yard, was nominated for the Nebula Award and was a finalist for the Yuji Foster Memorial Award. Together with Ellen Datlow, he hosts the monthly Fantastic Fiction Reading Series at the KGB Bar in New York. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be back. All right, so how this panel came about is that all of us were on the panel together back in episode 378, talking about awesomely bad 70s awesomely bad 70s and 80s science fiction movies. And toward the end, we started talking about Eon Flux. I'm not sure why. It's kind of off topic. Uh, and so I said, you know, that this is off topic. We can't talk about this now and sort of shut that down. And then, and Matt kind of joked like, you know, next episode, Eon Flux. <laughs> and then as I was uh, editing that, you know, I was like, you know, I, I love Eon Flux. It's like really one of my favorite examples of science fiction in any medium. And it came out, you know, it was, it was on MTV back when I was in middle school and high school. And, I, you know, I didn't really ever get a chance to talk to anyone about it because it was, you know, so long ago and I didn't have a podcast back then or anything. So I was listening to that. I was like, yeah, what the hell? Let's do it. You know, I, let's, let's talk about it because, you know, not only is it one of my favorite shows and I hadn't seen it in a long time, so I wasn't sure what it would be like to revisit it. And it's this very enigmatic show. And I was like, oh, I wonder what kind of what, you know, if I can figure out the mysteries now and if there's I'd be curious to see what sort of commentary there is now that might shed more light on it. And then it was interesting, too, in the process of preparing for this. I, I just assumed everyone really had seen Eon Flux. But in the process of preparing for this, I, I was just reading and listening to podcasts and things and, and really got the idea that, you know, that lots of people these days, especially younger people, just have no idea that there ever even was an Eon Flux cartoon and that's that's sad to me so in addition to all the other reasons for talking about it uh we can also help shine some light on this we need to change that we yeah yeah I mean, that's, that's just Flux unacceptable promotion group yeah yeah <laughs> well you yeah. don't have to worry about it because they're remaking it so it's going to be all, uh, uh, what yeah i read an article about that when i was just kind of noodling around on the internet while i was watching this and yeah there's a there's a remake coming out from mtv and it, unfortunately the showrunner is the guy who is the showrunner for Teen Wolf uh, series, which I didn't see, but I'm I, I'm guessing wasn't you know world shaking. <laughs> is Peter Chung involved at no. all? No, no, no. Oh man, no. So let's okay, yeah. we're getting a little ahead. Well, let's 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 we're, get we're to that. way ahead. Yeah. Let's get to that <laughs> later. But um, but so so Tom, I can tell you're just really raring to go here. So um, why don't you start out and tell us about? Do you remember watching Eon Flux back in the '90s on MTV? 
yeah, it's a good good idea to start with me because I was not a huge fan of this, and it sounds like you guys were. But um, but no, the way the memories I have of Eon Flux, and I was trying to think like where was I in my life at that point? I think I was a University of Maine college dropout who was living uh in my at, at my parents' house, and I was yet to go to Colby College, which is where I eventually graduated from. And I was working as a waiter, and I would go to like these parties and uh and bars and stuff like that. And there would always be like some monitor somewhere. There'd be like loud music playing. There'd be some monitor up in a corner that was playing like a TV up in the corner that was playing Eon Flux. And I would just be looking at it like, what in the heck is it? You couldn't hear it. And I was like, maybe if I could hear the audio, this would make sense to me. <laughs> but then, then when I watched it, you know, the first time I ever actually watched the series was when you told me I should watch it. We're going to do a show about it. So I was watching it and I was like, oh, it's silent. <laughs> oh, they're not, there's no dialogue. It's not silent, but there's no dialogue. So, but it, they would always play like the same episode over and over again on MTV and liquid television. And so I just kind of had no idea what it was, but I'm like, oh, there's just, like this fly trapped behind somebody's eyelashes. Or there's like the, the one, the episode with her, uh, the nail in her heel of her shoe, of course, is very iconic. And they would play that one over and over again. I'd be like, oh, that's really cool. When she gets to the top of the ladder, she's still got the nail in her shoe. And everybody would be kind of like talking about it. No, I never, I never had watched it, and um, always thought it looked kind of intriguing and bizarre, but never actually watched the whole thing back then. Yeah. So, how about that? Do you remember watching Eon Flux back in the nineties? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think I first caught it on Liquid Television. I was just an avid watcher of Liquid Television, and I can't really remember uh, any of the other uh, shorts that they had on it. But I do remember very vividly Eon Flux and Beavis and Butthead, and in fact, getting really excited. Uh, to watch liquid television just for those shorts. I had no idea what was going on when I first saw them. And for some reason, MTV, when they, when they did air, air Eon Flux, um, at least when I caught them, they, they never seemed to be in order. So I always felt like I was catching little pieces of something and never the greater story. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was like the coolest thing. I remember at the time and, um, and just always being really excited when it came on. Yeah, I can remember it was always on really, really late at night, and I would just be down. We had this finished basement, and I would just be down in the basement working out because I had to to fit, protect my because I was a teenager. You were getting buff, protect getting myself buff. from the bullies. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and then you got flux would just be on, and yeah, it was always like you never had any idea what was going on, um, but it was so cool, you know. And um, if, if people are listening to this who haven't seen it at all, so. Um, the main character is this sort of attractive woman wearing a combination sort of black bikini slash. It's uh, fetish gear. Fetish. I mean, come on. It sure is. <laughs> it's leather. It's like leather or pleather fetish gear, PVC or something. I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking PVC vinyl. <laughs> vinyl. Yeah. It's very shiny. <laughs> um, and, and, it's, and she's it's, got the coolest hair. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. hair is these kind of two black curls. And then she, uh, she's this, the ultimate assassin, secret agent, saboteur, uh, and um, is she ultimate though? I mean, she dies all the time. <laughs> that's mean, how ultimate she is. She dies and right, it doesn't even so stop ultimate. her. She, right. <laughs> um, and yeah, and it's in the future, uh, and it's in this sort of. It's never exactly clear what the background is, but it seems to be some sort of post-apocalyptic setting, and there are these two neighboring cities. And and it's it's very sort of deserted and run down, and there's just lots of empty hallways and giant you know metal corridors and giant rooms and things. Uh, so so it's just this, and and it's in yeah, and like Tom was saying, a lot of the episodes don't have any dialogue, and even the ones that do have dialogue are still very, as I said, enigmatic. And so yeah, you just and especially watching just bits and pieces of them, like Matt was saying. You, you never had any idea what was going on at all, but it was just so cool and so intriguing. Um, I just want to, like, g talk about that a little bit if I can. Well, for, Like, just – oh, go ahead. Let me yeah. just say first, I mean, so, um, you know, Andre we haven't gotten to Andrea yet. And Andrea – Yeah, no, please. We know from yeah. the last conversation that you had never seen Eon Flux before. Had never seen it. Oh, my I mean, God. I, I knew about it, and I had seen bits and pieces of it, but I never sat and watched it. So what was it like? coming to it as an adult um you know it's i gotta tell you uh i understand every <laughs> i understand everybody's uh, um attachment to it as a science fiction from their 
what early 20s late teens i suppose no for um, me like early like, i was like 12 when i was oh something. okay um i uh watching it now i was um oh boy how do i put this really irritated i was words. i was very uh it it immediately pissed me off because um i guess i'm just at the point in my life where i look at uh a female protagonist wearing a vinyl bikini and I go, yeah, no, um, I, I absolutely reject this, uh, on its face. Okay, um, now, did it, did it help at all that later on they had a guy wearing a vinyl bikini? <laughs> yeah, it that did was going to be my question. It, did, it, okay. it did not help. Um, I think it's just at this, um, I, I've, I have this l- bizarre obsession, um, because I, I spent the last couple of years watching a lot of, um, uh, superhero stuff, uh, you know, all the Marvel movies and the DC movies and the DC shows, the CW shows. And I have this obsession with what f- women superheroes wear. Um, and it annoys me when you put them in bikinis. It drives me crazy. And it also drives me crazy when they're wearing like high heels and fighting. So <laughs> it, it, um, it's the first thing I saw. And I couldn't stop looking at it. Uh, you know, it's just there. And I also happened to look, took a, took a long look at the credits and it's all men. So basically my entire, the entire shroud over me watching this for the past day has been, this is just boy fantasy. This is just, this is porn. Um, it, you know, it's a mostly naked woman with gun and, and boys seem to like that. Uh, so I have to tell you, and I apologize, you guys. You, I'm sure this was a very formative time in your lives watching this. But just as a woman, um, the uh, the thong bikini uh, outfit for an assassin is really kind of a no for me. So there you go. There, I'm getting off the soapbox now. I th- I think you just crushed Dave. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I thought everybody liked bikinis. I... <laughs> uh no i mean that's totally fair i mean but um i will the one thing i'll say about the the outfit is that it to, to my mind is that it makes no sense there, it's actually there's a funny scene where she's trying to look there's a guy coming down a stairway and she's trying to look inconspicuous like i'm, I'm just minding my own business and it's like how <laughs> inconspicuous or forgettable can you be wearing that outfit right so like like the whole <laughs> idea of a secret agent wearing the most attention getting outfit you can imagine really makes no sense yeah. at a fundamental level but it i does. mean it's also like everybody has their own chastity belt key for their significant <laughs> other like like you know it, it, like the whole society is is fetishistic but i i understand that how that could squick you if that's the first thing you saw and you let, let, yeah. let, me, let me just finish this the, the, the thing that it has going for it i think is that it does fit her character like that is what that character would wear in a sense and so it, it like you just look at the character and you kind of know, you know, like what she's all about, you know, like, yes, yeah, she's like a, she's in a bikini and she's got guns. You know exactly what she's all about. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like into BDSM. And like, you know, I mean, like, you know, if she was dressed in, you know, power armor or something, it would just like not fit the character at some level. I don't know if anyone, if I'm, anyone agrees with that or not, but. Uh, well, yeah, because I guess I guess you can make a case for that because she um, she definitely is all about uh, she has a lot of fetish type behavior and she's very centered around around sex. So, yeah, she would naturally dress like that because that's really what she all she thinks about, like right in the middle of like a, a big mission. You know, she'll be like, oh, well, let me stop and like lick the middle of this guy's ear. <laughs> it's a lot of, a lot well, of I do that, I do that all the time in in her defense. <laughs> in the subway, just a random <laughs> Yeah, oh totally. Yeah. <laughs> I lick everything in the subway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but so Matt, you I, I sort of cut you off. You were gonna say some stuff? Um I, I kinda lost my train of thought. <laughs> but I, I you know, like <laughs> I'm thinking about subway licking. You're, you're um, welcome. I mean, in like the first episode with real dialogue, the first thing that Trevor Goodchild does to to get the good graces of the the re- quote unquote republic, which is really a fascist police state, is basically just strip off all his clothes and go mm. naked. I mean, you don't see him. It's it was you know MTV and they didn't have that stuff. Um, 
and cartoon back then. But, uh, you know, it, 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 like, I, I feel like one of the, the things that I, I loved about Eon Flux was like, not just her character, but the show was that it was unafraid to just go where, where they wanted to go. They're like, yeah, we're just going to have like, you know, we're just going to be overtly sexual and we're going to have, you know, random scenes where people are like licking each other and like, you know, two, two people in, in, uh, spacesuits on top of a platform that's about to launch into the sun, giving each other orgasms by sending each other, you know, air, pressurized air through their spacesuits. And we're just going to have this go back and forth five times. And it, while they're and having it's like, a conversation. While, while they're, they're having like... a conversation. And like, there's even a thing where they just, um, you know, I think it's Eon walks into a room and she thinks people are having sex, but it's just like a weird piston that's at, like no reason <laughs> whatsoever being in the room. And then, you know, Trevor Goodchild is like, where is your mind going, Eon? But it's like the whole the whole show was like unafraid to, to kind of play play with that. And but, yeah. I, you know, I, I, like I, I feel that what what I really liked about her character was that she does not stop for anyone like any man, you know, any woman, like she's her own person. And I, and I think that, you know, if you can put aside the fact that, she, yes, she's walking around in a PVC bikini, like she's a kick-ass character. Like she's totally kick-ass. And like Trevor Goodchild presumably is like the most powerful person on this planet. And she gives him a run for, for his money. And like that, that to me was, was one of the like most powerful things of the show. But, I, you know, I, I, I feel like the other thing about the show, which I wanted to, uh, speak on earlier was was that the ability especially with the the silent episodes not the silent but the the no dialogue episodes but then later on was that you don't really get a lot of story but you're hooked right away that within like within like three to five minutes and sometimes even less i'm engaged i'm like i i'm excited to see what's going to happen and i don't even know why half the time it's like happening on this subconscious subliminal level and and it's just a strength to you know the animators and the writers about about creating this this engaging universe that there's something going on i'm not quite sure what's going on i don't i definitely don't have all the pieces but i'm i'm compelled i want to watch and and i think like as a writer i found that incredibly fascinating how they were able to do that and i think it's because they're playing with archetypes uh but it's more than that there's there's something about the the visual style of it that i found super compelling um it reminded me a lot of if if you guys ever read uh the inkle by by the the graphic novel by jodorowsky um no uh and you know mobius the the graphic artist uh, mm -hmm. uh the, yeah the artist mobius so he 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 mobius did the art and jodorowsky from jodorowsky's doing sure. that that guy uh he did the the inkle and it, the inkle is basically like Kind of as as batshit crazy as as Eon Flux. It's just you know what can happen next. I you know we open a hole into another universe. Why, of course, you know that's the way how they would get out of this. Right. Um, well, you know, like like okay, go ahead. Well, yeah. let me pick up on on the visual style because I think the visual style is absolutely amazing, and I, I feel like this show has so many unforgettable images that even after twenty years, they're they're burned into my brain and just such a an abundance of, of visual imagination. But then the other thing is that, I mean, Andrew, you were saying that this it's porn, but the thing that, I, to, wait, 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 so, so, so okay. the, 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 the thing that makes it not porn to me is that you have like this content that should be titillating, but it's all just gross. Like, like she's walking around in a bikini, but she's just like weird looking and the proportions are all weird. And like all the people are all like naked all the time and they're all, but they all look kind of like gross and off putting and, like there's all these like weird aliens and all the like, you know, all the like nipple licking and French kissing <laughs> and like like all that stuff. It's all just oh, like, that like French weird. kissing. It's all just like oh, weird yeah. and like just like <laughs> body horror and like it all just looks like like weird underwater creatures. It doesn't. And there's nothing like to me like really sexy about the show at all. It's like it's like this weird. It's this really interesting aesthetic where it's it's taking all this stuff. That in popular culture that's typically sexy, like the superheroes with no clothes and stuff, and then just making it sort of like weird and off-putting. Um, yeah. Do you not agree with that? That the visual style is... I I kind of likened it to um, the animation in Pink Floyd's The Wall, 
Yeah. Um, it yeah, looked a lot like that. Um, yeah. The porn aspect to me, and I just want to make it clear that I don't, I didn't have any problem with the sexuality of it. Uh, I thought that was fine. It was just the naked woman, the naked woman from the waist, practically naked from the waist down part and the giant breasts in the face part. Um, just, and this is also just also from an operational, um, standpoint. Uh, I don't, I'm pretty sure ne- none of you guys ever wore a thong. But wearing like, don't be so no, no sure. I I look I I'm not judging if you do it's totally fine I am very sex positive, uh, <laughs> but I'm just saying that running around in a vinyl uh, thong bikini is gonna chafe after a while, especially if you're jumping over things. And I'm just saying, like from a, an operational well, point of view, it's it's, 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 it's not future, very good you know? outfit <laughs> for <laughs> jumping <laughs> over things and. Uh, it, uh, that's it all I'm saying. Some kind of material that would, you know, wouldn't chafe by that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, sure, and also, sure, sure. I mean, this is, it's an animated universe. And, like, I don't want to get too far ahead and talk about why this doesn't work at all in live action. But, but everything in this is this sort of surreal reality that can only yes. work in animation. And that goes for the, you know, the high heels and the thongs as much as, but it goes for everything. And, you know, like how the characters move and how they, their acrobatics and just like everything, you know, doesn't work literally. It only works in this this weird alternate animated universe. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the it's the sound effects too because when that you you reminded me of the the French kissing and it's like their tongues are like eight inches long coming out of their mouths <laughs> and wrapping around each other and there's all this like liquid coming off their tongues and then you yeah it is like, disgusting. It's totally <laughs> disgusting. Yeah, I, yeah, like I, hear, I never found you, the show titillating hear, at all. No. And then you hear Good yeah. Child whenever he's making out with her doing that. He's like, oh, he sounds like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds like he's eating like a, a hero or something. Yeah, it doesn't sound enjoyable at all. So, 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 yeah. So, um, I don't want to just dwell too much on the on sexuality. the sexuality aspect of the show. Although that's actually much. When I went back and watched this, I I, I thought that the weird sex was like twenty percent of the show. And going back and watching, I'm like, eh, it's really more like fifty. Five percent of the show, there, it was yeah. like way more than I remembered. But it was um, it was really more. It was innuendo more than actual sex. There's oh, a yeah, lot like, of innuendo. Like he's operating on her back. And oh god! That little machine <laughs> in her back, and the woman's like moaning. And here I am, like fifty year old man watching this. I'm like, that's kind of weird. It kind of almost sounds like she's having an orgasm instead of having a back <laughs> operation. And I'm like, and then it took right. me like. Ten minutes later, I'm like, oh, that's the point. I'm sorry, I completely <laughs> like, yeah, that's what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, but 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 yeah. But, but so moving on. So I mean, the uh, let me just say, like one of the things that really fascinated me um, about the show was the uh, the politics angle. And so mm. so yeah, there are these two cities, and one of them is Monica, which seems to be some. Sort, we're not really sure, but seems to be some sort of like libertarian, anarcho something kind of society, and that's where Eon comes from. And then there's this other. There's a society of Bregna, or I think one of the characters says Brenya at one point, but Brenya, Brenya. yeah, it's like the Italian pronunciation. Brenya. <laughs> so I, I, I was going to go with Bregna, but if people vote Brenya, I can go. I can. I think it's he, Brenya. He, he does say Brenya. Brenya. All right. Yeah. So so Brenya is sort of um, a, a republic which is quickly falling into a dictatorship under Trevor Goodchild, who's this sort of combination of um, Julius Caesar and Victor Frankenstein. Um. <laughs> And, uh, and so like there's this episode where you see that there's this wall dividing the two cities that's very much like the Berlin Wall. And people are trying to escape Brenya and get to Monica and are being killed or uh, mutilated, um, by the, the city's defenses that are trying to keep them from escaping. And, um, and so yeah, just, just the character of Trevor as this sort of smart, sexy, uh, somewhat ambiguous, dictator love interest I, I just think that's really that was always really interesting to me and and just the um uh i guess it's the other episode the um utopia or deuteranopia you sort of see the uh the recently deposed president clavius and there's there's something very roman empire to me about mm-hmm. about yeah. all that stuff yeah um so so how about let's move on to to that do you uh matt what did you think of were you struck by? Did you do you feel this is a sort of interestingly political show? 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I mean, there, there's a lot of, the, like I said, they're, they're playing, they're playing with these, these archetypes. I mean, I definitely got the, um, you know, East Berlin, West Berlin vibe, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, after a while it, it, it was less about that. I mean, like, you know, Eon supposedly is trying to sabotage Brenya, but she never really <laughs> succeeds yeah. in any of that. And then I'm all wondering, like, who is she working for? Is she just trying to get with Trevor? I don't, I don't really understand. Um, so I mean, like, th that political subtext, um, was intriguing, definitely. I mean, I, I think Trevor was a, was a great character in that he, you know, when you're in his point of view, and like this is true of a lot of, you know, malignant narcissists, when you're in their point of view, everything they do seems really rational and seems like he's like, I do this for the good of the people. This is the only way to save humanity. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, yes, yes, of course. Of course you have to murder half the population to yeah. save everyone. You know, you know, of course you have to like, um, you know, put put your your former leader in some sort of weird vibrating state to keep him isolated from everybody else and and then have a a dressing room inside of his body like what <laughs> the hell was happening in that episode i don't know but um you know it, for me it was um the the science fictional ideas like i i love the this this notion of being like really far in the future that things have evolved past kind of our point of understanding. And they, they talk about this in the very last episode, but like the, you know, the Nargyle, this little creature that evolved to create this, this capsule that you take and you just forget everything. Like, I thought that was just so cool. Um, you know, uh, the Demi urge, like, like this spiritual being that they somehow captured, um, you know, the, the, uh, I forgot the name of the episode where they have the uh, the underwater research laboratory. It wasn't even in, in water. It was in some kind of paralytic fluid. Li liquid, yeah. 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 And then, of course, you know, Trevor Goodchild's like, yes, of course, I have to build this thing to experiment, to, to you know, to find a way to save humanity. And, and you're like, yes, he does. Wait a minute. He's, this is totally <laughs> crazy. Um the 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 custodian which uh which is like this weird sort of spindly mm -hmm. robot that goes inside the bodies that and was just my the, the yeah just the sound it was making when they pulled it out of the body it was making this weird sort of high pitched screeching and then it would go in the body go in your body and then basically take you over very clockwork orangey mm -hmm. and and turn turn you into like you know kind of a, a happy automaton and y you know you you realize like oh this is what this is what Brenya is trying to do. They're trying to, you know, th their society's falling apart. He's doing anything he can to save it. Um, and, but he, he's clearly a psychopath. I mean, but, you know, and, and, and Eon is, is in love with him. Eon is obsessed. I don't know if in love is the right word, but she's obsessed with him. And I don't know, the, the whole, the whole, risk taking of the show the ability to just sort of run with an idea that anyone else would be like yeah that's that doesn't make sense like why would you have a train that was paper thin go like separating you know east and west berlin like why would you have a train that's like a half an inch thick with but in that scene they're like making out through the through this hole in the wall and then of course you know the train comes and cuts them off and you're like well of course you know <laughs> why wouldn't there be a train one inch wide um it's it's just a it's bizarre and and I feel I feel like um I ha there's not that many um science fiction shows or films that really capture that really take those kind of risks. Um you know, I've seen m maybe uh what was the word, the movie um Valerian and the Thousand Planets mm -hmm. what was that oh, yeah. called? Yeah, that's uh, what and it's called. the and and then the Jupiter ascending, like both of them, I feel like yeah, they weren't great films, but they took risks, and I and I feel like I would like to see more of that in science fiction. I would like to see, you know, you know Hollywood or, or the production company say G give a director full control, say you know, you have full control, and sometimes that goes really well, and sometimes that goes horribly. But you know, it can go horribly wrong. It can go horribly wrong, and, and also, has. and it has, and and. In this day and age, the, the amount of money it costs to make a science fiction movie, nobody's going to do that. Nobody wants to lose that much money. Well, let, let me pick up, Matt, on what you were saying about the uh, the secret boudoir inside Clavius's chest, right? Because I thought that that was really – that was one of the most 
poetically interesting things to me in the show is that um, Trevor Goodchild is promoting this total transparency in society. Everyone's just going to be on camera all the time, including him. And everyone's going to be well behaved because it's this total surveillance state and no one has any secrets from anyone. But then, of course, he's obsessed with this Monacan spy and he doesn't want anyone to know about that. So he's created this secret room where they can be together. And so it's totally hypocritical. And that, that just I think that's really interesting. I mean, it reminds me a lot of, um, you know, Augustus Caesar uh, was really interested in morality or sort of enforcing morality through Roman society. At the same time, he did not want, you know, he had all these uh, uh, mistresses and everything, right? And so, you know, you see this a lot in leaders where they, they have some utopian vision or some moral vision for for the society that they want themselves to be exempted from. And I thought that this just like creepy basement where you've imprisoned the, you know, whatever remnants of democracy remain, and that's your your secret, you know, hookup apartment, like... Uh, there's just something like very just memorable, you know, that it, it expresses that hypocrisy so so vividly. I I was I was seeing a lot of uh, parallels to what's going on now. Um, personally, um, it was it was actually very our our, our <laughs> somewhat slide into fascism right now, um, and the hypocrisy and the uh everything is is very applicable to what's going on right now i felt um it was very prescient uh looking back on it 20 something years ago so yes yeah, it mean, was very Augustus political Augustus caesar would be kind of he'd probably be kind of quaint today people be like oh that's nice you're cute oh you have mistresses and stuff okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like yeah but have you ever paid off a porn star really like if you want to play with the big boys these days you know i you personally have boy. not I think my life is the poorer for it too. Um, all right, but anyway, so um, yeah, let's talk about. I guess what were some of? Let's see, Tom, you were saying that the uh, pur the purge that was one of your favorite. I want to talk about what what everyone's favorite episodes were. Um, so, Tom, yeah. what were some of your favorite episodes? Yeah, the purge. I guess I didn't realize that was the name of it, but yeah, that was definitely my favorite episode where they had the. It was like this, it really made me realize that the Matrix owed a huge debt to that episode in particular and probably to the whole series, the movie The Matrix, because the, the little squid thing that goes in Keanu Reeves' tummy in his belly button, like they pull it out of his belly button because it's like mm -hmm. a, it's a bug. And I, I remember thinking when I watched that movie, like that's so inventive. It's like this little like wiry little thing with like a transistor on it and it's like in his stomach and they pull it out and then. After I watched the whole movie, I was like, well, why does that, it doesn't really make sense because he's in a computer program, so why is it shaped like that? And I was like, well, I, I don't know, it's just like a cool way to have it be shaped, I guess. And then I watched this episode, and I was like, holy cow, they just like basically lifted that, like the, the, uh, the conscience. You know, thing. I never realized that. You're absolutely hmm. right, yeah. Yeah, that, that was like straight, and even like the way it comes out, like sh they pull it out, and then they like break the thing off the top, and it like kind of goes dark, and it, like goes still. And uh, I was like, oh, it's just like The Matrix. And they, so they clearly, like, they clearly really loved Eon Flux and they kind of borrowed. What that. year was The Matrix? It 99. was after Eon Flux. Yeah, 99, yeah. okay, yeah. Yeah, it was a good bit after Eon Flux. So I love that. And I love the idea. I love the, um, I love the way, like, she, she gets unconscious and then Trevor is, like, playing with her and saying, like, did I put one of those things in you or didn't I? Like, you know, do you have this thing controlling you or are you making your own decisions? And then that was actually a really philosophical episode, too, because I do you remember yeah. at the very, very end, she sees the, the custodian inside a cage or something and mm -hmm. then it pulls the lever over and, and does, over. It does uh -huh. the move that she did. So you think like, well, did she, is that, you know, is that her like seeing like, oh, like that's the that's the same move I made. It's the same exact pose I did. So it must have controlled me. Um, and then, yeah, at the end she doesn't, but she doesn't really still a hundred percent know whether she's being controlled or not. And I love the, the, my favorite thing, like I agree with Andrea to some extent that I, I was like, well, come on, like all these, they keep showing her breasts like giant size and <laughs> like right in the lens. And like, I was, and some of the fetishism, I was kind of like, what the heck is going Like when she handcuffs him to the bed in one episode and he like, He's like, oh, you got to let me out of here, but he doesn't really care. And then he, like, licks the handcuffs. And like, yeah. <laughs> and she, and I, and and she says, I, I've always wanted to see you in that position or something like that. Right, right. And for anybody who hasn't seen the show yet, it's not 
what you, when I say that she handcuffs him to the bed, it's not like a, a love scene or a sex scene mm-hmm. or something. They're like fighting over something and she like handcuffs him. And then he's like, oh, no, now he's, now his plans are foiled. But instead of being like angry, he like licks the handcuff. It's like, <laughs> oh. uh, so, uh, yeah, some of those things I kind of found like off putting. But my favorite thing about the whole series was the unanswered questions. And it really made me realize how like everything today has to be explained. Explained. In yes. To, mm-hmm. to the extent yes. where they're taking like all the remakes and sequels seem based on the premise that. Okay, all the mystery that was so brilliantly injected in most of our mo- most beloved fictions was actually a problem. We have to go back and like explain, like go back and make a prequel to explain like why all this mystery was there and like remove it. Like um like the like the midichlorians thing and the phantom menace mm-hmm. was a long time ago, but oh, let's explain the force. It's actually based on these little organisms that are Well, the Han Solo there. movie, which I liked, but they didn't need to explain every little, you know, yeah, point of his origin, yeah. No, I I agree with that, that that it does not treat you like a child. It doesn't explain stuff. You get it, you get it, you don't. It doesn't matter. It's going to go and tell its own story. Um, And that is one of the good things about this show, is that it doesn't treat you like a, uh, like a fool. Well, let me yeah. say, I mean, that was always one of the things I really loved about this, was this sense of mystery. And, you know, I, I always wonder, at, oh, I wonder if I could figure out what's really going on. But I feel like they took it too, like going back and watching it now, Maybe it's I think I feel like I have PTSD after um, <laughs> uh, Lost and Battlestar Galactica, but like I'm way less willing to give science fiction the benefit of the doubt that that this isn't just weird for its own sake. And actually there is that this would reward trying to figure out the mysteries. And so like some of these things like like this episode Chronophasia, um, I, I do not believe for a second that that makes any sense that anyone can explain what's going on in that episode or that I could, I Which feel like I could, that? okay. She, um, she, she keeps waking up on this altar and is kind of bouncing oh, yeah. around through time. And there's one in the weird... underground world. Yeah. And there's this like little kid who says all this cryptic stuff to her. And then there's this like giant baby with giant vampire teeth <laughs> um, that keeps killing her. Yeah. Yeah. And she keeps dying and waking up again. Um, yeah. And so, like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that the mystery is one of the great aspects of the show, but I feel like in a lot of the episodes, I just, I, I lose, watching it, and watching it as a kid, I, I loved them all pretty much, but watching it now, some of these, I just have the sense, like, I don't believe that there's an explanation for this. I think it's just, like, a bunch of, like, weird dream imagery uh, that won't yeah. necessarily reward trying to I figure agree. it out. I agree, I agree with a lot of that, but I think as a, as a subset of the mystery, there was also this really cool thing they kept pulling where, like, none of the characters actually knew what was going on, but you as the viewer could see, like, stuff that was happening. I can't think of a good example right now, but they would always, like, show, um, you know, these, these things were happening, and, and you see people in different rooms doing different things, and they'd, like, open up a door and be like, what is going on here? Um I really like that too, how there was like mystery for the characters. Like they didn't understand what was happening, even when you did. Mm-hmm. How about Matt? What did you, th- what do you think about, do you like all the mysteries or do you think some of them were too confusing? Um, I, I was just along for the ride. I, I, I think that, um, like you, I, I, I don't try to necessarily piece all the parts together. I think that can lead to insanity because <laughs> I don't think they always necessarily had, had, a had anything in mind they're just throwing weird weird stuff in there um you know there's like the train car with grass in it yeah of course there's grass in a train (laughs) car why wouldn't there be grass in a train car um you know you have all this advanced technology uh as security measures but of course you would have a weird sort of um cyborg beast guarding your underwater experiment lab like you know just stuff like that i was it was just weird and cool and i didn't um try to try to piece too much of it together but when when you when things did connect i i found that really kind of rewarding and exciting um did did you like all the episodes about equally or or were there ones that stood out to you no no there were absolutely there were definitely episodes that that uh that stood out i i think that the purge was probably um the creepiest with with the uh the custodian that that custodian just creeps me the hell out like <laughs> that's that's like the stuff of nightmares um mm-hmm. the one with the, with the nargile which uh, i don't remember the title of that episode uh, it's like re-razure 
Re-Rager, yeah. That one I thought was, there was just something really haunting uh, about the ending of that. Um, you know, the, this this drug that is formed inside this creature that basically causes you to forget everything. Um, I, just, I found that kind of powerful. Um, like I said, the, the one with the underground, the underwater uh, ex- uh, experiments in the habitat, um, that one was just also really weird. It was like, yeah, we, we need, you know, they, they arrive on this basically a submarine and everything's fine, but somehow they can only leave by joining their bodies together into one being. And they're just like, yeah, that's the only way we can do that. And then they just <laughs> join and they leave. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I'm going with it. Like I didn't try to figure all that out, but that one, um, I really liked because because Eon, we think she dies. I mean, she gets trapped in the fluid, but the whole time, the whole episode, you're expecting her to escape because you're like, oh, yeah. well, the hero, the hero always escapes, right? Um, and she's like, you know, constantly getting out of danger. And you're like, oh, now she's going to escape. Now she's going to escape. And then she doesn't. And you're like, oh, that was that was a really powerful and affecting ending. And I remember when I first saw that, I'm like, but, but, but Eon, like, <laughs> like, what happened to her? Um, but I, I, my favorite is well, the but, last. But also, episode. Matt, that okay. she, she's not dead, but she's sort of she's frozen, know, suspended paralyzed. animation. But she, you get the feeling she's conscious. You know, she, she's she's conscious, which is which is even more horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then you see that you see the key go into the the, the thing that will deactivate fit, yeah. the paralytic yeah. fluid, and it just and it misses. almost hits and goes away, and it's just like one in a trillion chance, and then it misses, and that's it, and she that's she's she's stuck there presumably forever, which is just horrifying. I mean, it was hor- yeah. it was a, it was a horrifying ending. That that to me was a horror story. Yeah. Uh, but I think my favorite episode is probably End Sinister, and I'd like to talk about that if I could. You know, this idea that she's basically responsible for killing off the last of humanity. Which is basically what Trevor was almost doing half the time. Why don't you just then, just quickly just describe the premise of the episode? Um. Oh God, or, how do or, I describe this? Or maybe I'll maybe I'll quickly describe the premise of okay. the episode. So yeah, so, uh, so 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 Trevor is planning to um fire this oh, okay, yeah, some yeah. sort of beam at the Earth, which is going to kill half the people, uh, for the betterment of humanity, and <laughs> so uh, force it, force uh, the rest to evolve. Yeah. yeah. And, and in the course Supposedly. of this, and, and some, firing this beam sort of shoots down this passing alien spaceship or like quote unquote alien. And the alien has no bodily orifices. So it, it only looks and thinks and doesn't eat or have sex or, you know, um, defecate or anything. And, and so, um, and sort of this weird thing. So it has this sort of like gap where it's stomach and genitals and, you know, heart, heart and everything would be. Um, and then it turns out at the end, then there's, I mean, a lot of stuff happens, but it basically turns out that who we thought were the aliens are actually the future evolution of humanity. And Eon thinking that evil aliens have wiped out humanity, kills them all basically, uh, only to find out that she's the one who's killed, killed off humanity. I, I think that's more or less <laughs> correct. Right. And then, and then they show the same scene twice yeah. and and that really bugged me out the first time I saw it. I'm like, wait, what's going on? And then I, I think that they they showed you that twice to basically, you know, now that you have the knowledge that she killed off humanity, to oh. show that when the aliens, quote unquote aliens, are communicating with her, like at first you, you think that they're threatening her and trying to send her like, we're going to hurt you, we're going to do this. But then later on you realize – no, we're trying to communicate with you. We're trying to stop what you're about to do. Um, or, or at least just, you know, we're not the, the threat you think we are. And, and it, it was affecting, but I think that they could have gone further with it. I think that there was a couple of missed opportunities there to, to show you, um, the same scene again, now that you have the knowledge that she's about to basically kill all of humanity. And I also got this weird sense that she was in some kind of time loop, that she was going to repeat this forever. Um, yeah, and there's that, definitely that... some sort of time travel going on. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a pretty confusing episode. But, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but I, I just thought that the, um, just the weirdness um, of the, of the future, you know, alien slash humanity, just the way they communicated, um, how they couldn't speak. So you, you just had to, you, and you, you basically, uh, projected your own, um, thoughts onto them and that's basically what what eon does and um 
just the idea, like, I thought it was extremely haunting that even, even the, uh, the cities of, uh, Brainia and, and Monica were, were hor- horrible, uh, you know, dystopias. But then when she wakes up, uh, several hundred years later mm-hmm. and goes back and that's gone and there's an alien city, like, that to me was like, oh my God, what happened to, to Brainia and, and Monica? You know, this, <laughs> this beloved, dystopias like hmm. i i miss them and the, I, I found that affecting that she goes to the city and like but if you if you if you look at it again uh after realizing that they are humans you're like oh wow they actually evolved to to uh become something better and built this beautiful city and we're presumably living in a utopia and a kind of harmony and and um i don't know why they left this satellite in orbit for 500 years that could kill them all but um you know it's eon flux anything could happen but uh that episode to me, I found the most affecting. I think. How about how about Andrea? I mean, we're talking about all these sort of philosophical themes in the mm-hmm. show. Did, did were you um, moved by by any of I, that? I really liked the episode, and I'm looking at the episode list here online. It's the one that I really that I really enjoyed, or enjoyed. I found affecting was um, it was called "A Last Time for Everything." It's when uh, Trevor creates a second eon and uh yes. and they trade places yeah that was yeah, cool. yeah and that the was real really cool. the real eon actually falls in love with trevor uh and it's it's just a really interesting change for the character she completely changes her look at that point in that uh episode she puts on it's a, the yeah. first time <laughs> she puts on a she does she puts on a dress um and not it, she also she the hair goes away and she has like straight hair. It's the first time you ever really see her with straight hair, um, and she be, it's just a very it's really sad. And the copy yeah. the copy continues to be the killer, whereas the real Eon allows herself to be killed and yeah. dies and, and dies in Trevor's arms. Like he tries to save her and he can't save her, and she kills her. She allows herself to be killed. It's just a very um, yeah, it's really was, sad. Very affecting. Yeah, that was there's that a, was there's amazing a... because because it started out as like she's gonna hide and pretend she's like this super weak version right. of herself who has no no self will, and then she tells the real weak version of herself who has no self will like you got to pretend to have a strong will like I do and go out and do all this stuff, and so they switch places and then gradually like she can't break out of it and the other one can't mm-hmm. either. And then, yeah. yeah, and then she, she, the real one dies and the, and the copy goes on being her. And you're like, her. that was an interesting, that was super interesting. Like, well, what does it mean to be a person? Like, if yeah. two of you and they both have the same memories and everything and one of them, yeah, yeah, that, I thought that was fascinating too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that episode was by far the most accomplished in terms of its like plotting and sort of satisfying mm-hmm. storytelling that all yeah. makes sense and everything, you yeah. know, like. That that one. It wasn't so much mystery. It was it was really like more of an emotional episode as opposed to like this mystery science fiction kind of thing. Yeah. It, yeah. it was about it was actually about the relationship between her and Trevor because you know up until that point and after it's always been like they're they're rivals. They're like spy versus spy. Yeah. Um, you know they're constant rivals, constantly trying to kill each other, but also constantly not trying to kill each other. It's just like a game to them. Everything is a game to them. This was different. This episode, the relationship between them changed, and it was really interesting to see it. Yeah, different. Um, yeah, and and in that episode too is the part where the where um Eon and another sort of secret agent type character named Scathandra, who has hands for right. feet, they have to cross right. this DMZ together and help right. each other avoid the um, sentry turrets, and it's just a great, amazing mm-hmm. visual visual sequence. Yeah. And the one before that also, which is thanato- thanatophobia, thanatophobia, yeah, um, which is the one with the woman with the uh, the spine injury, yeah, the the two yeah. lovers have been um, uh, separated. It starts off with the guy talking, and he's got like fingers missing, and then uh, she loses her legs because she gets caught trying to escape again, and then you, the last scene is of the boy with no arms. And it's just very. That is the, one of the creepier ones, personally. Yeah, it was me. creepy. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's also I, I, well plotted in the sense that mm-hmm. like everything, if you go back and rewatch it, like you know she's making, she's manufacturing the um 
you know, the machine that ends up amputating yes. her. Yes, yes, exactly. Oh, I missed that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The little parts, the widgets that, that yep. are that are part yeah, that of the was... machine that, that, yeah. I remember the first time I saw that, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Of course, the bright orange part that, you know. Exactly. You see exactly. It, but... it was very, um, uh, uh, what's the show? The old science fiction show. God, me, me, my inability to remember things when I the need to. The old show? Which show? That old show. You know the that old show. That one. Oh, that one. <laughs> outer <laughs> Limits. Me, like Outer Limits. It is very... Oh. Okay. okay, yeah. I, I really like the, um, that episode just to sort of the, the claustrophobic aspect of it and like these two apartments you could see wind across to the window mm -hmm. in the other city that's separated by this you know uh yeah. you know barrier where they'll, they'll shoot you dead or they'll cut off your limbs if you cross it but yeah you can see into the, you can see across into their windows, into like, their windows i just yeah. love that I, I just love that concept well that is very berlin wall they could yeah, see yeah. into each other's homes yeah, yeah. see did anybody look up the uh any of the weird words in the titles of the episodes or uh, weird names in the episodes. Well, thanatophobia yeah. means fear of death. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's Greek. Thanatos I knew that one. Guy who would god of... Thread was the... Yep, Thanatos was the god of uh, death in Greek mythology, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was... Uh, I, I picked up on a few of them. They were brilliant names and words. Like, Onan was uh, a king from the Bible who just masturbated all the time. Right. Well, that's oh, not that exactly dirty Bible. <laughs> correct. Uh, okay. No, I mean, no. He he was uh, commanded. I mean, he was commanded by God to impregnate his brother's widow or something like that, and he like pulled out because he didn't want to 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 father a child with her, that's and right. then God that's struck right. him dead. Ah, okay. So it was, I'm not sure how that's did, relevant to this show, but. but he did it. But he did it repeatedly. Well, I, I noticed that I noticed that uh, that they named that guy Onan, and yeah, I, I didn't know why it was relevant, but uh, but also the uh, there was a it wasn't Scathandra. I I read an article today, and I think it was Scathandra, or it was another name that means diving bell, which I was like, I wonder why, in in like another language, I was like, I wonder why diving bell. I wonder why, because he obviously uh, Chung obviously had something on his mind when he was picking all these names, but I'm, I'm just. I would have to sit down and watch it again and really think about it. I mean, Matt, you you wrote a novel about the with sort of the religious mysticism kind of stuff. Did did any of the right. stuff from this show ring any bells for you? Uh, I mean, a, a little bit. I, I I saw online that it may have been influenced by Gnosticism, which I'm not super familiar with. But like you know, the demiurge and then the eon mm -hmm. is, and then the the syzygy, which is like supposedly eon and Trevor were like two aspects of the syzygy, but, um, you know, I, I didn't necessarily feel those connections strongly. Um, I, I thought some of them, like they, they play with archetypes more, more than, you know, with the exception of the couple of epi episodes that you mentioned where there were like stronger narrative arcs. I felt that a lot of times they're playing with these, these archetypes and, um, the one where they they captured like the demiurge, it just it seemed like sort of a like a Hindu like god or mm -hmm. goddess. It was, um, and and it was just very the the uh, even even to the point of like the flames around around the body was was mm -hmm. kind of like the the dancing Shiva. So it it, it was, um, you know, I saw aspects of it, but I didn't I didn't really feel a connecting thread through throughout. But I don't know if that was your experience. <laughs> Did did anybody else notice the um, visual nods to MTV itself? Um, the dress that uh, Eon wears, um, the white dress, is very Madonna, like a virgin. Oh. And in the demiurge, when when the baby is born, the god baby, it's it's the Nirvana baby from the cover of Nirvana. Oh, the baby, really? yeah, the baby swims in uh, in a in water. It's this it's the shot from the Nirvana cover. You know. I, it, it's like I watched it and I'm like, yeah, this is familiar, but I didn't know why. And like, <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and rewatch. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there were other ones that I missed, but those are the yeah. two I caught. I also love the. Um, it's in the early episodes before they do a lot of dialogue, where there there's just a, an elevator that has you know a sink and a tub and a, and a toilet. Like, why not put that in an elevator? Like, <laughs> you know, who doesn't want a bath when they're going up from the third I, to the second floor? <laughs> <laughs> Um, does anyone know much about Gnostic Christianity? I know a little bit, no. but no, not a lot. 
No. No. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just say, so, so the basic idea, as I understand it, is that the Gnostic Christians, I mean, I think there were a lot of different sects and everything, but 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 the basic idea was that they believed that the the God of the Old Testament was sort of a fake God that they called the Demiurge, and that he had created the material world. And the reason it's all fucked up is because he was sort of this fake, incompetent God. And then there was this real God that had created the spiritual realm, which was perfect. And then Jesus was an emissary sent to Earth to teach everybody the knowledge that would allow you to escape from the fake material world into the perfect spiritual world. Um, and then eons are some somehow aspects of the real God. So, so, so basically like angels, I think. Um, trying hmm. to see what else I... Clavius, I don't know if this is... Uh, apparently Clavius is one of the largest craters on the moon, and it's named after Christopher Clavius, who was a great Jesuit science, like early scientist of the 16th century. Hmm. Um, and then one of the episodes is called Ether Drift Theory. And yeah. so before, you know, apparently from Aristotle, it was thought that light would not be able to propagate through a vacuum. So the heavens must be composed of some sort of material substance. And so that was called the ether, the luminiferous ether. Right. Um, and so um, somebody, A. Maxwell, proposed an experiment which would be able to measure the movement of the earth through the ether. And when the and that was the ether drift theory. And when that the experiment, Mitch, the Mitchelson Morley, right? The yeah, Mitchelson yeah, yeah. Morley, of, yeah. Oh well, well, Matt, why don't you uh, fill us in here? Yeah, well, they they basically they they did this test where they had, uh, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, there were two lasers uh, pointed perpendicularly to each other, and they could measure precisely the frequency of each. And the theory was that as Earth drifts through the ether, one side would be shortened more than the other because the ether is they they basically the theory was that the ether was the medium by in which light moves like sound moves through air right mm -hmm. um light they thought needed to move through the ether so they this experiment was to detect earth moving through the ether and they thought okay we're going to measure we're going to do this experiment um i think it was either 3 or 6 months apart and the idea was like earth would be I think it was six months apart. Earth would be going in different directions through the ether. So the uh, measurements on this experiment would change because they were perpendicular to each other. But they found out it was exactly the same, that the, that the uh, frequency didn't change, and therefore there was no ether. So this, this experiment basically disproved the ether, and then um, along came Einstein with his special theory of relativity, and the rest is history. But uh, I did not know about ether drift theory, but I guess that's what that was. Is that yeah? That's my that understanding. Okay. But I, I think the okay. connection to the show is just the idea that just as it was once thought that there was Earth was a world traveling through this material substance, that in the episode there's this artificial world that Trevor has created, which is traveling through this liquid. Um, so yeah, that's that's does this this is post Borg cube, right? Yeah, that'd be post Borg cube. It definitely looked like a Borg cube. <laughs> the habitat? <laughs> yes, it did. It yeah. did. What was that other movie? Um, it was called The Cube, right? The Cube? Where they were, yeah, they were just... The they, traps? Yeah, was that before or after this? It's probably after, right? I think uh, it was after. I think it was after, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, cubes are cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, then the other, you know, there's Utopia or Deuteranopia, and Deuteranopia refers to the uh, red, green, color blindness. I, I'm not, I'm not sure what that has to do with this episode, but uh, I'm open to theories. Stop and go. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't I, don't, know. I have no idea what that stands for. One thing I wanted to to run by everyone is that watching the pilot, I watched the pilot a couple times and. The Wikipedia description or the Wikipedia synopsis basically says that there's this plague that's killing all the soldiers that's being spread by this bug and that Trevor mm -hmm. catches it and synthesizes a, a, a cure um, yeah. fr from the bug. And I had the distinct impression that the bug had always been Trevor's pet and that he had intentionally spread the plague that he was then curing in order to ascend to power. Well, he that does cut the bug I, out of his, of his finger. finger, and then he drinks the pus. Yeah. He, it was really weird. Yeah. Um, because when it when he, catch, like, quote-unquote, catches it, it seems like it's just crawling right into his hands to me. And, right. But, but the, the other piece of 
uh, information that's kind of interesting is that after he takes it out of his um, finger, he puts this sort of Band-Aid on over his finger. And you see one of those Band-Aids floating in the giant room full of blood before he gets the before he picks up the bug. Did not catch that. So that leads me to believe that he's done this. You know, he's taken the bug out of his finger before and taken the Band-Aid off before. Mm. Hmm. I also found that episode really affecting. Uh, there's that one scene where in, you're in the point of view of one of the fallen soldiers, and he mm-hmm. hallucinates like this cartoon frog or Fish. something, and yeah. yeah, and and then it just sort of disintegrates into a dead body, and then you realize he's just hallucinating, and and, and then I'm like, what what was that? Was that a cartoon from his childhood? Was that? It, it was just. It was really haunting. I don't know. What did you guys have that effect? Yeah. Yeah, I thought the, this is like, that's the first episode, essentially. Yeah, the very, Correct. it's like four minutes. Oh, no, it's 10 minutes long. 13. Yeah, it's about 10 minutes. Um, just watching it, um, it just struck by the incredibly good storytelling without dialogue going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I, it, the, the use of the, the, you know, the wah, wah, wah for talking, uh, yeah. I thought was really interesting. And, there's that shot of like he's he cures it and then he's got like the wife with the beautiful baby um and it was just it was it's very uh propaganda like all of it yeah i think as as a writer um and i don't know i don't know if this is something that you guys would agree with but i think that you know i i learned a lot from this just watching like how to set up a narrative really really quickly like the you know, you're in this, like I said before, like, you know, within a minute of each episode, you immediately know, like, who's the protagonist, who's the antagonist, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're going for something, you don't necessarily know exactly what they want, but you care about them getting there. Um, I don't know, I I just found that um, it it was very interesting um, narrative way to set something up, you know, that I haven't seen something done that well since uh that short film at the beginning of up I oh think it was yeah also silent it was yes. also silent i mean that one is 10 times more affecting than, oh god yeah than eon flux but i but i they, they were kind of doing the same things this this way of just very quickly setting up a narrative very quickly pointing you to the to the important points and then you're like okay all right i know i know generally where this is going and i'm engaged and I, and I just think that's it's worthy of looking at as a as a writer and seeing how they do that. Yeah, and they do a really good job setting up tension too, where they they'll like just show you like some oil dripping off a pipe onto the floor, and then they'll cut to like some people doing things, and then they'll show you the dripping again for a little while. Mm-hmm. You're like, why do they keep showing us this? <laughs> right. What's going to happen and the, here? Or... And and the tack, the tack in her shoe. Yeah. They yeah. set it up, and then you're just waiting for the the tension. They just keep building the tension by cutting yeah. back to that tack, um, yeah, and, and like you're waiting for the payoff, the and then you get it. She, you think she's gonna like step on the tack, and then she crawls across this one thing to another ladder and starts going up that one. And you're like, oh, she it didn't happen yet. So you're like, yeah, you're waiting the whole time for when it's gonna poke her. Yeah. So I, you know. As I said, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this show is so that I could go online and read up on all the fan theories after 20 years and finally put everything together. And I was really surprised by how little I was able to find, at least in on YouTube and um, podcasts and things. I mean, I found some stuff that I, I watched and listened to, but uh, I, I was sort of surprised by how small the profile of this show is now, because um, I, I had this sense that lots of people watched it back in the day. Um, and one of the YouTube videos I watched said that really the, the 2005 live action adaptation starring Charlize Theron just like obliterated basically the reputation of the animated series that, wow. you know, everybody saw this movie and it was terrible and it kind of like killed the whole franchise. It it was a terrible movie. I, I, I was super excited when I heard they're making an Eon Flux movie. And I came out of that theater just despondent. I was like, oh, they just <laughs> ruined it. They ruined it. And even now, like, I, I don't remember the movie that well because, what was it, 2005? So I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, like, went and watched the trailer on YouTube. And even the trailer is bad. The trailer, you're just like, wow. This just looks it. horrible. It just looks so bad. And 
Oh man, you, I I could just see a good director. I mean, I I actually don't think that, like, I don't think Eon Flux would necessarily work as a live action film. I think there's just so much that they're doing with, and I think you said this at the beginning, Dave. There's so much that they're doing with the animation style mm-hmm. that doing it in live action, unless you're doing something really really different and crazy with the cinematography, I just don't think would work. It maybe you can do it now because, uh, um. Special CGI. effects have, yeah, CGI yeah. has advanced so much that you can actually do different strange things now. Um, yeah. But I have, I've never seen the movie. I have to watch it now. <laughs> it's horrible. It's That's so what I hear. Bad. It's 9% on Rotten Tomatoes. I actually, Ooh. you know, when it came out, uh, I thought that it completely failed to capture the magic of the animated series, but my perception was that it was sort of a run of the mill, mediocre B grade science fiction movie. But I just went back and rewatched it, and and it's much worse than I remember. So, um, yeah, it's 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 not good. I mean, and there, apparently it had a really troubled production where, um, you know, the, the and the director it was an acclaimed director. It was this up and coming female director. She had directed um, Girl Fight. Uh, Wait, not Karen Kusama. It's Karen Kusama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I know Karen Kusama. And so she. Uh... She directed um, Jennifer's Body, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, everybody's talking about that right now. Yeah, but but so apparently, um, like she turned in a like a two and a half hour, or maybe like a three hour long version or something, and um, the MTV thought it was way too sort of artsy, and they like chopped it all to hell. Mm-hmm. And watching the movie, cool. it's impossible for me to believe that any version of it was good, although I don't really know for sure. But um, there was all and there was all sorts of problems. Tom, were you were you going to say something? No, no, go ahead. What about the uh, original crea- creator? Um, was he? He just didn't. He, Peter Chung. He doesn't have any uh, rights to this. No, no, uh, I, no. He he. When it came, I read an article today. It said when it came out, uh, he was he was just despondent too. He he left the theater and was like, they they've completely ruined it. It's an absolute travesty. They've like it, it is a travesty. It. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I gotta watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, Dave, I had the kind of reaction you did. I I had not been a big fan of the, you know, I just had never watched the series. And when the movie came out, I was like, oh, cool, a science fiction movie. And I watched it and I was like, yeah, kind of like a entertaining B-grade science fiction movie. It's not, you know, it's not something I'm going to watch a bunch of times, but I didn't, I didn't hate it. But uh, I'd be interested to go back and watch it again now and see if I had that same reaction. That, that it's yeah, well, let me just read you the exact uh, quote from Peter Chung. He says, the movie is a travesty. I was unhappy when I read the script four years ago. Seeing it projected larger than life in a crowded theater made me feel helpless, humiliated, and sad. Oof. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so he wasn't involved with it at all, and he's not involved with the uh, the new MTV um, TV series. He, he, I actually saw. He, he said that, like, you know, his, his you know, that that Eon Flux um, represented his interests at the time, and his interests have changed so much that he wouldn't really be interested in doing any more Eon Flux at this point. So, right. um, you know, I, I think even if they wanted him involved, he 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 would decline. But, um, like I I I think that from everything I can see, he's what makes Eon Flux work. You know, yeah. like yes. he yeah. he has this real artistic vision, and um, and it's sort of this very thoughtful um, you know, person. And I'm I'm really really skeptical. I mean, I'm skeptical that any, as I said earlier, that any live action version would really work. I mean, I, I would be happy to be proven wrong, but. You know, the, right. the fact that it's like Teen Wolf and it's the same producer um, as the movie. Um, I think it's actually Gail Ann Hurd, who actually has done a lot of good stuff. But, um, you know, just nothing about this makes me optimistic at all. Right, right. Hmm. So so one of the things you said, Dave, just in terms of like you didn't see a lot of Internet profile for Eon Flux online. So, I mean, part of it, I think, is it ended in in 95 right Mm -hmm. um yeah and you know i don't know if the internet was that widespread at that point and and then probably by 2005 when a lot more people were online and this movie came out that probably just killed all interest people like oh yeah and flux that crap you know and and even now when you google eon flux the first thing that comes up is the film not the not the Mm -hmm. animated series yeah you have to type Uh, cartoon to get this yeah I, I yeah, think people it, should should watch it. 
because uh, like it's it's also really ripe for cosplay. I mean, the, the soldiers, <laughs> like the the weird, not not just Eon Flux. I wasn't going there, but but yeah, Eon Flux. But like the weird sort of Andrea, steampunk soldiers. Right yeah, right. <laughs> absolutely. What I'm going to be wearing. No, but I wanted to go as one of those um, like steampunk soldiers. They wear that like that blue uniform and then have that weird sort of metal headpiece that looks almost like a, a retain like a, um, a re- yeah like a retainer like when yeah. you have braces. What you know. Um, <laughs> It's just like cool. Like there's so many cool uh, things in it, and and um, you know, I, to me, this is like a seminal piece of science fiction. I, I feel like that this is something that you know, if if it hasn't already, it should go down in history as 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 unique and and um, and interesting and and stand out. Yeah, I, I, I totally. I love the, the the design of the soldiers with their yeah their blue and gold uniforms. And and in the movie, in the live action movie, they just made them like black stormtroopers. Basically, it's like mm-hmm. they 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 leached all the everything that was interesting out of it. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I I think I've made it pretty plain how highly I I regard the show. Um, although actually, I, I was kind of surprised like how many of the episodes I was kind of like, eh, you know. But there's like seven or so episodes that i think are just brilliant and that have stuck with me all these years and my my extremely high regard for the show is based on a very very small body of material but it's just the Mm -hmm. body of material that i think is just like nothing else i've ever seen um but so um so tom what do you think about that oh yeah i mean i think it's i think it's a it's a menacing menacing show it is it is kind of a seminal science fiction thing it's kind of it kind of has a a, the same aesthetic of like the prisoner that old that old science fiction show or the old spy Mm. science fiction show yeah um where there's all these bizarre things going on and you're not really sure but you know something something sinister and bad is happening and people are trying to fight against it um although maybe not trying to fight against it more maybe trying to fight in the context of it but um yeah I, I think it's 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 definitely worth watching. Uh, it's definitely going to be off-putting if, if, for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, just in the same way that Andrea found it off-putting, there's going to be a lot of people today who are going to be like, "Why are they telling us to watch this?" With the woman walking around with the fetish gear on and the giant breasts in the in the lens all the time. But um, yeah, it's it's worth watching if you if you are not going to be bothered by that. See, Andrea, have we uh, convinced you to? improve your rating of the show I, at all? I, I do not have a problem with it as a science fiction show. My problem rests squarely on the vinyl uh, string bikini outfit. Um, if you had worn, if she had worn fetish gear, full body fetish gear, like a whole vinyl suit like she does in a, actually a couple of episodes, I'm totally fine with that. It was just like having to, the, the large breasts stuck in my face and then the bare ass for the entire time was just annoying. <laughs> um, but other than that, the actual, I, I think unfortunately it took away from the uh, actual themes of the show and the, the really good scripts and the way, it, how well done it is for me personally. And I don't know if that's just a function of me being a cranky middle-aged lady. Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. But, <laughs> but um, as a as a body of work, as a piece of science fiction, it's really good. I, I'm not taking away from that at all. Does that make you feel better, Dave? Yeah. Well, I, I'm just wondering now if some hardcore fan can go through and just use the uh, like the fill tool and paintbrush and like, fill in, <laughs> like use black, right. you know, fill it in with black and you know, make make the put Andrea it, approved for put, it, of put her in like a put her in like a plaid a line skirt. And uh, you know, like maybe like a cashmere sweater, <laughs> like cat, like a like like a Catholic school girl. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, well okay. Well, no, not not like a. That's very like, fetishist you know, too. The, yeah. No, not that. Yeah, sorry, I was I was going more like respectable, bookish, like maybe something out of the Graduate or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Matt, were you going to say something? Um, you guys said at the beginning there's there. That they're doing more with this, or did I miss here? That yeah, MT- MTV is is remaking the series. They're, they're doing a a reboot of the series, a live action. Live action, really? Oh, is it so live action? You, yeah. Oh, so, do you God. know like who you said it's the? Who is the writer behind it? 
Well, I don't know the writer, but the uh, but the the showrunner is the guy who did the Teen Wolf TV series. Right, right, right. Okay, so, yeah, you did, that's right. You just said. So we, but but beyond that, you don't know anything. No, no, I, I think that's know. all that they've announced so far. Okay. Oh, okay. That's all that I. I mean, there's just like some um uh, articles on like the Hollywood Reporter and stuff like that. Um, but, but right. that's that's everything that yeah. Tom said is everything that I remember of them being okay. reported so far. But yeah, Dave, you, you were talking about how there's not much online about Eon Flux either, and yeah, even even you know the usually IMDb. If you go to the trivia section, they have all kinds of cool little things in there that just you don't know if they're true or not, but there's lots of them. But there were only four little trivia items, and they weren't that interesting in uh, in IMDb. And I, and I, yeah, I didn't find it. I was looking for articles on it too. I was thinking there was going to be tons of like people like explaining what things are, or, like talking about their theories, and you know, like you said, fan theories. And I, I didn't find anything there either. One thing is that there's there's like a shockingly a shocking dearth of interviews with Peter Chung about Eon Flux. And I don't know if he's just sort of media shy or doesn't want to talk about it, but like he gave one interview to this, um, this website, like Monacan spies on live journal or something. It's like a, <laughs> you know, fan group. And that's, that's, that's like the only, and I was, there was an, he did an interview on this. Uh, I listened to on this podcast. Um, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the podcast, but it, it was, it's like this two hour long conversation, but it, barely touches on Eon Flux at all. And apparently he told the interviewer, I don't I want to, I don't want to talk about my specific career that much. Um, so yeah, I think that probably that has contributed to it, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I was, as I said, I was surprised and I don't know what else I could have been able to find. That's just, you know, websites and things like that and articles, but um, cause I, I didn't, I just didn't really have time to look at that stuff, but I'm just surprised there's not like, a podcast that does an episode by episode, you know, exegesis of, of the show. Cause it seems so ripe for it. Um, yeah. I guess one other thing I'll mention that's kind of interesting is that there are some, there are actually some good ideas in the movie, in the, the Charlie's their own movie. I mean, they're really badly executed, but, um, the thing, the three things that I kind of like from the movie are, um, there's, she, she sort of takes this, um, you know, in the in the TV show, um, Trevor at one point passes a like a photograph to her by kissing her, and in the show they make it this sort of like digital device that she swallows, and then it creates this VR like conference room in her mind where she gets a mission briefing, and I thought that yeah. was kind of cool. Um, there's like this grass that's like, like like it's literally blades of grass that tries to yeah. sort of, like reach yeah, for you. Cool. Um, yeah, like and then too. there's this like weird, like blimp thing flying over the city. That's this archive. And it's weird because all that stuff in my memory was actually from the show, the cool stuff that's in the movie. And then I went back and watched the show and I'm like, oh, that stuff's not in it. You know, it was really weird, like false memory implantation. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but that stuff I, I think is all cool. I really liked also in the movie that she had these little like steel ball bearings that when she whistled, yeah, they would, yeah, like, roll roll down the tunnel and like stick around this door and blow it up. Yeah, that was another thing actually that I thought was <laughs> in my memory was in the show, and and then I was like, oh wait, it's not actually. Um, but yeah. Um. All right, cool. So we're pretty much out of time. So why don't we get some uh, some final thoughts in here? So Matt, final thoughts on Eon Flux. I'm going to leave leave you guys with a quote from from Eon. The stars in your eyes, they're stolen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I seriously, I think you um you know, people should watch the show. I you know, um with Andrew's caveat in mind, if, if that's go- <laughs> if that's going to bother you, uh then maybe it's not for you, but I I think that there's enough really um really clever and fascinating um, science fictional concepts in this show that I really haven't seen elsewhere. Um, it was, it was really fun revisiting this. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to see, um, more science fiction creators do stuff like this. This, this, um, you know, we need more of this and, and less of reboots of, of, of stuff we've seen a thousand times. Uh, Tom? Yeah, I'll leave you with a quote from Eon as well, from the the antagonist from the uh, the episode with the custodian. I, I'm into antisocial behavior, defecating, and drinking rum. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite quote. But it was longer than that too. I can't remember the whole quote. But anyway, uh, no, I, I think, I think it's great to have experimental stuff like this. I loved how it kind of had a, uh, an aesthetic of like a, uh, a, a web app flash based puzzle game where you'd see all these little elements and you weren't sure how they were going to come together and then they would. Um, that was really fun to me. And, and yeah, it'd be really cool if people could, if you could take more risks and maybe, as the cost of animation comes down, the cost of CGI type animation comes down, maybe there will be like low budget stuff in the near future where you can, somebody can just be really inventive and just try all kinds of crazy stuff and have uh, somebody who's just a good storyteller bring out something that's, that's new and different without having to worry about if the studio thinks it's going to work or if the, uh, you know, if there's going to be a, a massive budget behind it or if it's going to draw enough eyeballs because it isn't a reboot of something we've already seen. And, and like I said, I certainly love the the mystery that they left a lot of open-ended questions like what's going on here? We don't really know, but it's going to kind of stick in your head. I really enjoyed that. So I'd be glad to see more of it. And, and like like Andrea, I'm not really <laughs> crazy about all the fetishism and all the... All the... <laughs> All that stuff. Well, I, maybe maybe I got that wrong, Andrew. I apologize. I don't want to put words in your mouth. <laughs> but yeah, I wasn't I wasn't crazy about that stuff. But overall, it's certainly certainly worth watching. And Andrea, final thought. Um, I, I just want to make it clear: I do not have a problem with fetishism. I just don't have. I have a problem with with female assassins who wear next to nothing while doing very acrobatic things. I'm just telling you. I got that wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a, I, I, I just, if we're going to have female superheroes, can we just put clothes on them? Cause, cause bare asses. It's just, it's really, um, it just doesn't work. You know, take it from somebody who's, who's, who's boxed before, like fought before. It's, it's just really uncomfortable. Just telling you that. Uh, anyway, that bare asses and large breasts stuck in the camera aside. Um, it's, it is an, <laughs> it is in fact an actually very good science fiction show. Um, and I'm glad I watched it for this just to see it. It w it was actually ahead of its time. And unfortunately in this age where everything is being rebooted because nobody wants to, to, um, risk money, putting money into uh, an expensive science fiction show. Um, it, it's nice that they're rebooting it. I hope that they do it justice. Um, yeah. And I actually do look forward to seeing what they do. Fingers crossed, it doesn't suck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would be, I would be happy if the show is good to to watch it. But I, I really feel like the the lesson of this show. Is that you know I, I go back and watch it now and I'm like I can't believe this was on television. Mm -hmm. You know I, I absolutely it just astounds. I, I, and I watched it you know but like going back and watching I'm like I can't believe this was ever on MTV. You know like but and it, yeah go ahead. But but it, th see that's the thing that that's what MTV was at the time. It was one giant experiment. They had a ton of money and they could put it into things like this. We are post experimental television we are post experimental entertainment because it's just too expensive to to start something new that you don't that doesn't already come with an audience this does already come with an audience that's the problem that that's why everything's being rebooted that's why everything every movie you see is based on a book or a play or a play is based on a book or a movie everything's being rebooted because nobody everybody's afraid of losing their money yeah, um, and, then, and Oh, sorry. You no, know, it's just it, it, we have to start taking we have to start taking risks again, and that's where indie indie film comes in. That, that's that's where young filmmakers come in, and that's where young film filmmakers making f movies with the sh the twenty dollar camera they bought it at the B and N um, come in. Um, that's where innovation is going to be. It's not going to come from large corporations. Uh, yeah, uh, that has. I'm, I've just gone off completely off here, no keep but, going i'm loving it this is but that that is what the truth is that is what yeah. the truth is what's going on in hollywood right now yeah there's a there's a massive irony that that you look at this and they're saying that some studio somewhere is saying or i guess it's mtv is saying this you know what was great about Ian flux it was super original people love yeah. that originality you know what we need to do we need to reboot that exactly yeah <laughs> like exactly like rehash that and turn that out over again instead of doing something creative it's almost like the the Monty Python quote from Life of Brian where the guy's like, no, you're all individuals. And the whole crowd's like, yes, yes, we're, we're all individuals. Yeah, individuals. <laughs> yeah. And then the one guy's like, well, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, exactly, that's that. exactly where I was going with that is that, you know, 
th th this is a show that came about because somebody somehow gave Peter Chung some money and basically said, make whatever you want. I mean, I think there were some limitations, but like far fewer limitations than I, I would have had any reason to expect. And he made this thing that's just amazing to me. And I don't think we need any more episodes of it. I mean, I think they made too many episodes of it as it is. Like I said, like, you know, there are like seven that I think are just great. But that's sort of the lesson of it to me is that, you know, it doesn't, you don't need five seasons of a show to make something worth remembering, you know, like this is, you can watch this in three or four hours and it's just this mind blowing three or four hours. And, and, and it's, and it's great. And we don't need more, you know, more episodes, in my opinion, we don't need more episodes. Like, oh, I wonder, like, will Jan and Trevor get married? Like, it's like, we don't need that bullshit. <laughs> you know, we need like yeah. more things that, like Tom's saying, like that were like this when it first came out, not just mm -hmm. more of this. And yeah. that's, that's like, to me, the big takeaway of this show. Yeah. Well, that's what, what, like Netflix and Hulu, that's what they're doing now. That's, they're, they're taking the place of like the MTVs, um, you know, 20 years later. They're, they're making things like, um, you know, Black Mirror and OA and all those, all those shows. Um, you know, that's yeah. where the experimentation is coming in. Limited series. Yeah. And make stuff that's animated. That's not just like, yeah. for kids and stuff, you know, cause, cause that's another thing is that this shows what animation, you know, animation for adults or at least for teenage boys mm -hmm. can do, <laughs> you know, and, and it, that, that you can't do in live action. And that's such a unexplored, you know, or such a, you know, there just needs to be more like this that takes advantage uh, that's that's like groundbreaking and has an artistic vision and uses new art, you know, mediums mm -hmm. media to, to, to present this, its vision. Yeah. So, so I'll get off my soapbox now, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so let's, uh, let's wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Andrea Kale, Tom Gerenser and Matthew Kressel. So thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Andrea Kale, Tom Grenzer, and Matthew Kressel for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.